This is lesson 28 of Hunger and Thirst for Righteousness. David has mercy on his persecutor. And so this is going to be a really great lesson because this is a truly a core teaching of Christ is to have mercy on those who are our enemies, have mercy on those who hate us, have mercy on those who were valors, have mercy on those who persecute us. That's his way. There's no, no exception to the mercy that we should show in our lives. And so let's go ahead and get to it and we will uh, have a good conversation today. Um, so we're in 2nd Samuel 19 at the moment. We are going to go back to the 16th chapter also. I implore you to read the whole chapter for yourself, just like I do every time. I'm going to use uh, the verses needed to paraphrase the situation and address what happened, but I'm going to leave it to you to read the, the Bible in detail, okay? And so, so then it says, uh, then it was told Joab, behold, the king is weeping and mourns for Absalom. The victory that day was turned to mourning for all the people, for the people heard it, heard it said that day, the king is grieved for his son. So if you listen to the last lesson, you know that David is very, very, very sad at the moment um, about his son being killed in battle, who actually tried to overthrow his kingdom. But it's the love of God in his heart is that he, although that's what his son did, he still loved his son. He still loves him. So then it says, so the people went by stealth into the sea that day. As people who were humiliated steal away when they flee in battle. The king covered his face and cried out with a loud voice, Oh, my son, Absalom. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Then Joab came into the house of the king and said, Today you have covered with shame the faces of all your servants, who today have saved your life and the lives of your sons and daughters, the lives of your wives and the lives of your concubines, by loving those who hate you and by hating those who love you. For you have shown today that princes and servants are nothing to you. For I know this day that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead today, then you would be pleased. Now therefore arise, go out and speak kindly to your servants, for I swear by the Lord, if you not go out, surely not a man will pass the night with you, and this will be worse for you than all the evil that has come upon you from your youth until now. So let's talk about this. And I'll just talk about something very specific that he said in this situation. He said he, he, he is covered, covered with shame, the faces of all his servants who today have saved your life. So the people who have done good for him, who saved his life, he said, because you're loving your enemy, you are putting shame Shame on your own servants who saved your life. He said, because you love your enemies, because you love your enemies, that you put shame on the lives of your sons and daughters. You put shame on the lives of your wives and you put shame on the lives of your concubines by loving those who hate you. And he says, by hating those who love you. Now, is that true? This is also his perception. We know this perception is not true. We're receiving a, um, a uh, I would say, a flesh perception of choosing love. We have to understand this is what we're going to deal with. This is why it says the, the Lord literally said that he'll turn a father against a son, a mother against a daughter-in-law. And, and they, these relations in our household are going to be in conflict. Because this is the reality is that when I love someone who is my enemy to those who don't believe in the way to who those who don't follow the way it is a shame to them. They, to them, I look weak to them because I love someone else. I hate someone else. That is the way of flesh that because I show love to someone to love, love to someone, that means that whoever that was against them, I must hate. That's not true. That's not true at all. We know David did not hate his own people. But just because he loved his own people who even stood up against him with Absalom doesn't also mean that he can't love Absalom. That is completely the way of the flesh to believe that because I love this side, I can't love that side. And that's not true. We do have the ability to love all people in all circumstances. And just because I love one person who may be against you, doesn't mean that I hate you and it shouldn't be a shame to you. But that's a telling of these people's hearts in this story. Next it says, so the king arose and sat in the gate. When they told all the people saying, behold, the king is sitting in the gate. Then all the people came before the king. 
Now Israel had fled each to his tent. Each to his tent. So now we're about to get into this section where we have a couple people who are going to come and visit. They're going to come and visit uh, King David, okay? Now we're going to go all the way to, to uh, Shammai, okay? Um, he has a very powerful story in the situation. He is the persecutor that we are looking at that David is going to have mercy on. Now we're going to look at the situation and how David communicates to this person because he's showing his mercy. So let's see the reality of what it looks like to show this mercy. But we're also going to go back and look at what this man did to David. What this man did to David and how strong David was in faith to choose mercy. Because we're going to see very clearly not many of us would have the ability to choose mercy in this situation. So it says, Then Shammai, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, who was from Behurim, hurried and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. There were a thousand men of Benjamin with him, with Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, and his 15 sons, and his 70 servants with him. 15 sons. His 15 sons and his 20 servants with him. And they rushed to the Jordan before the king. So, Shemaiah is rushing, rushing to go see the king, right? Rushing to go see King David. Then they kept crossing the fords to bring over the king's household and to do what was good in his sight. And Shemaiah, the son of Gareth, fell down before the king as he was about to cross the Jordan. So he said to the king, let not my lord consider me guilty, nor remember what your servant did wrong the day when my lord, the king, came out of Jerusalem so the king would take it to heart. So he's literally apologizing. He says, please don't take it to heart what I've done to you. Please have mercy on me. Please uh, don't consider me guilty in this situation. Please don't even remember what I did to you. Please have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Then he says, for your servant knows that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I have come today. And this is still Shammai talking. The first of all the house of Joseph to go down to meet my king, my lord, the king. But Abisha, the son of Zeruiah, sorry, said, should not Shammai be put to death for this because he cursed the Lord's anointed? So here we are. We have um, Abisha, right? Who is, you know, in a sense, he's speaking to the law, right? He's speaking to the law. He's saying, this man has cursed the king. This man has come against the king. This man has persecuted you. Should he not be put to death? But once again, it's also kind of a follow up of the last lesson we just did. The last lesson we just did talking about the difference between God's law versus God's heart. Is that we know the law. But we also have to understand God's heart, but if we actually understand the law, we'll see God's heart in the law. When we don't understand the law, we don't see God's heart in the law. What most of us don't understand is that these pronunciations, which we talked about last time about the law, the law was set in stone from the beginning of time. Most of us don't understand that these charges of who should be put to death and all these things are not for humans to are not for humans to play out. It's knowledge for humans to know what will cause me to experience spiritual death, but it's not for humans to put other people to death. It's, that's not what it's for. In truth, his law is in command for the angels to, to uphold. It says the angels obey the voice of his word. That's what it says in Psalms. The angels heed to the voice of the Lord, of the Lord, of, of the Lord God. So most of us don't understand it. And Jesus Christ is a good job of outlining this in a parable um, in the gospel when he says that if we don't have mercy on each other, then, the, then God will send his angels to torment us. That's the truth. He didn't say he'll send humans to torment us. No, he's going to send angels to torment us because you'll understand it's the angels that carry out the word of God. They're the ones that have already been told what to bless and what to curse. They've already been told that. So when the law says such and such sin, so much be put to death, it is not for a human to do that. That is a spiritual death that they are going to experience 
that the angels will come and they will take care of it. It's not for you to carry out. It's for the angels to carry out. But David understands. So let's go into what David said. Then David, David then said, what have I done with you, O sons of Zeruiah, um, that you should this day be an adversary to me? Should any man be put to death in Israel today? Should any man be put to uh, be put to death in Israel today? For do I not know that I am king over Israel today? The king said to Shemai, you shall not die. Thus the king swore to him. Thus the king swore to him. And I, I love this story too, because it's such a, a coming to, um, how do I say this? This is like such a parable for coming to the Lord and asking for that forgiveness. He admitted that he was wrong. He admitted, he turned, he said, I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Like, I repent. He repented. Some of us have such such flesh and such dark hearts that even when someone says they're wrong and they repent, you still want to put them to death. But that's not God. That's not God. God is simply waiting for the obedience because he's already, like he said, he's already set the stone from the beginning of time. What is going to be punished? What's going to be blessed? And, and how to obtain mercy? Has always, if you read the law of God in, in, in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, there are laws for forgiveness. It's always been there. But David understands. And I did find this interesting as I'm, as I'm reading this. Notice it says Abisha, the son of Zeruiah, right? I keep messing up that word for you guys. Zeruiah said, should not Shammai be put to death for this because he cursed the Lord's anointed? Now notice David actually looks at him and says, what have I done with you, O sons of Zeruiah, that you should this day be an adversary to me? He calls him an adversary. Why? Because is he not imploring him to put this man to death? who has repented, who has now done the right thing that he needs to do to have be, be given mercy. You're coming against me at that point. You're coming against me in my relationship with God and my salvation when you try to counsel me in that way. What have I done for you to be an adversary to me? Now, Abisha doesn't even understand how he's being an adversary to him, but David does because he understands and he knows the way is mercy. So then he, he showed him this mercy, right? He said, you should not die. Thus the king swore to him. Now we're going to go back because I want to go back to what actually happened with Shemai. And we talked about this in a prior lesson. We actually had a whole lesson about Shemai and what he did. But I want to go back and touch on that because it's very important to see just, um, you know, on our journeys, the Lord even said we're going to be persecuted. But notice that he still calls us to forgive those people. And I'll be one of the first ones to admit, incredibly hard to let go. Someone that you genuinely love, someone you genuinely gave truth to, you know, you, you genuinely fellowship with, you, you've done nothing but good to them. You have nothing but good intent in their life. And, we're, and they're persecuting you, talking bad about you, throwing stones at you, gossiping about you. That's a hard thing to swallow. It's very hard. But it is the way of Christ. And so I want to read this and then we'll keep going on. And we're almost done here today. It's a, pre, uh, a much shorter lesson than usual. When King David came to Behurim, behold, there came out from, them, from there a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shammai, the son of Gera. He came out cursing continually as he came. He threw stones at David and at all the servants of King David. And all the people and all the mighty men were at his right hand and at his left. Thus Shammai said when he cursed, get out, get out, you man of bloodshed and worthless fellow the lord has returned upon you all the blush of the house of saul in whose place you have reigned and the lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son absalom and behold you are taken in your own evil for you are a man of bloodshed so this man literally is calling him um he's literally calling him a murderer he's calling him um let's see he's calling him a murderer He's saying that, yeah, you're reaping what you sow right now. Like, yeah, the reason why you're going through this is because you've done evil. 
Because you done evil. And it's funny because Shemaiah actually, when he comes to David uh, in the last um, part of the story we were just talking about, when David had mercy on him, he literally says to him, like, you know, can you forget my wrongs? And he also says, can you not count me as guilty? But I get why, even as I read this right now, because he genuinely believes. He genuinely believes that David is this evil person. And he genuinely believes that David is going through these things. He's losing his kingdom because of the evil that he's done. But I see clearly that once David conquered that situation, that once David conquered, he saw clearly, no, he wasn't going through that because of his own wrongdoing. So he apologized. I think that's the right thing to do. It's funny because even as I read this, I'm actually growing respect for Shammai. I'm growing, growing respect for him. Because it's something many of us cannot do. Is that we've been deceived in the past and we've been wrong about somebody. And you said, oh, this situation is because uh, 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 how they, because their their disobedience and their evil and all those other things, and then God shows up in their life that no, I'm with them, and 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 no, they're obedient. I'm with them. But do you have the strength to go and say you're wrong and apologize? It's funny because this lesson we're supposed to be learning a lot about David's mercy on the persecutor. We're also learning about the repentant persecutor. Are you able to be strong enough to say you're wrong? It'll go a long way in your life. So then we're going to continue on from here. We're going down. So David and his men, David and his men went on the way and Shammai went along on the hillside parallel with him. And as he went, he cursed and cast stones and threw dust at him. The king and all the people who were with him arise weary and refreshed himself there. So I just put this on here to, 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 to note just how deep the persecution of Shema really was. Like this man literally came out of his house cursing David. He never talked to him one time. He was stoning him. He literally was, was walking with David on his journey parallel to him, which means I, he didn't cross his path. He was just walking alongside him, throwing stones at him the whole time. The whole time. And we see the mercy that David extended to him. So here's Jesus, Matthew 5, 43 to 45. You've heard that it was said you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I said to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he calls his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And so this is the word of the Lord. Is he literally says we should love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. So that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. He says that if we don't, if we're not doing those things, we are not his sons. If we are not loving those who persecute us, and we're not praying for people who persecute us, we're not praying for enemies, we're not loving our enemies, we are not sons of our father. That's what it says. So that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. He says, do this so that you may be that. If you don't do this, you're not that. going down for if you love those who love you what reward do you have do not even the tax collectors do the same if you greet only your brothers what more are you doing than others do not even the gentile do the same therefore you're to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect and so once again god has called us to be different and i love how he says don't even gentiles doing that he's saying people outside of the faith he's just saying people who don't believe in god are nice to their friends And this is something I've been saying to a lot. Uh, I've been saying a lot recently. I feel like in the last six months, this this kind of type of verbiage from the Lord has been hitting me a lot. Um, even people who who don't believe in God are nice to their friends. People who don't believe in God get married. People who don't believe in God are people who don't believe in God that don't drink. There are people who don't believe in God that they, they do all types of stuff. But this is why I say those things to say those things do not make you holy or righteous or any of those things. Those are things that people do who don't believe in God. God is called to be different than the one who doesn't believe in God. And that starts with loving those who hate you and, love, and, and, and uh, praying for those who persecute you. So 
Luke 23, 33, 34, it says, when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him in the, in the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. Now, I love this once again, because Jesus is literally being crucified at the moment. He's on a cross being crucified. He is being, he's, he's receiving the ultimate persecution. But as he's received this ultimate persecution, what does he say? He practices what he preaches. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And you know what? I love that statement too. He says, why forgive them? Because they're ignorant. And weren't we just talking about with Shammai, how he was showing that he was ignorant? I think Jesus would have would have would have wanted God to have mercy on Shammai also. And so I ask you this in your life: who who was just ignorant? Who just did not know? And are you strong enough to have mercy on them? Last verse, Hebrews twelve three: For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you would not grow weary and lose heart. Consider him. And I think I love when it says consider him because when you're in the middle of a situation, when someone's coming against you, consider him, consider the way he behaved as he was being treated the way he was treated. When you're in the middle of being persecuted, consider him. When someone's in the middle of, of cussing you out, consider him, consider him, consider him. Considering him is the only way that we can do right by God, by, by holding strong um, to that example that he gave to us. Consider him. Consider him. It says if we don't consider him, it says consider him so that we will not grow weary and lose heart. If we don't consider him, we're going to give up. If we're not doing this out of, uh, uh, to, to be like Christ and out of our love for God in consideration and thought of him, you're going to grow weary and lose heart. You're going to give up. You're going to say it's not worth loving people like this. I hear it all the time. People say, I tried. Or I just got tired of it. It's because you weren't doing it for the right reason. You weren't, consider and you weren't considering Jesus Christ. And so that's the end of our lesson today. And so this is the tithe and offering. We will pull $200 a week to ensure that God's work can and will continue through this ministry. Um, the rest of the money that is uh, accumulated will be distributed back out evenly to everyone that gave. That's cash at money sign Christ King way. And so this was lesson 28 of hunger and thirst for righteousness. David has mercy on his persecutor. Have a blessed day.